Let's be clear, we've all seen the video by now. It's obvious these former police officers killed George Floyd. The Hennepin County Medical Examiner and the medical examiner hired by the family of George Floyd have concluded that his death was a homicide, but their opinion differs on the cause of death. But if both of them declared that his death was a homicide, does the cause of death really matter? Yes, because the trial is going to involve all of these former police officers and their defense will likely hinge on this specific topic. Now, I want justice for George Floyd, and that's why I'm making this video, because the medical explanation for the cause of his death is not a simple explanation. It's actually more complicated than most people think. So I'm going to break down from a medical standpoint what led to his death. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Mike Hansen. I'm board certified in three specialties, internal medicine, pulmonary disease, and critical care medicine. As a pulmonologist, part of my job is to figure out why people can't breathe. As an intensive care doctor, part of my job is to care for people who are on the brink of death, like when someone can't breathe. Sometimes people die in the intensive care unit and part of my job entails pronouncing death and then completing a death certificate form where I have to put down what caused the death. And this is more of a gray area than most people realize because the cause of death is just about always multifactorial, meaning there are actually lots of causes that either directly or indirectly lead to death. So I'm gonna ignore the topic of brain death because that's a separate discussion by itself and not really pertinent to this video. So for all intents and purposes, when someone dies, that means their heart stops pumping and they stop breathing. This is known as cardiopulmonary arrest. Most people don't know that in most states, I'm not allowed to write cardiopulmonary arrest as a cause of death. And that's because it's not really a cause of death because it's always something that leads to cardiopulmonary arrest. So there's always an underlying cause of death that leads to cardiopulmonary arrest. For example, let's say someone has a viral infection that causes pneumonia and ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And let's say their organs started shutting down because of this. So they have kidney failure, liver failure, etc. What would be the cause of death in that scenario? The answer would be essentially all of the above. The virus started it all and that led to them getting ARDS and they couldn't breathe on their own. And as a result of this, their organs started dying and ultimately that led to cardiopulmonary arrest. Now, what if I told you that that patient was a smoker and had diabetes and high blood pressure and were morbidly obese? Well, those are all indirect contributors to the cause of death, but not direct causes. So really it's always a multitude of factors that contribute, some more than others, and some more direct while others are more indirect. Another example is let's say when someone with cancer is getting chemotherapy and their immune system is severely weakened, meaning it's suppressed because of that chemotherapy. Well, if they get a bacterial infection that spreads throughout their entire body, meaning sepsis, they then go into septic shock and multi-organ failure and then cardiopulmonary arrest. Well, what's the cause of death in that scenario? Well, it's really all of the above. They're all interconnected and they all play a part in that. So not always, but usually the cause of death is multifactorial. Now, before I get to what asphyxia means, we need to understand some basic human anatomy and physiology. Our breathing is actually controlled by our brain. Some of our breathing is controlled consciously with a big part of your brain, the cerebrum. But most of our breathing is not done consciously and is controlled by the very central core of our brain, the pons and the medulla. The pons and medulla are very sensitive to three things. One, a decrease in oxygen level. Two, elevated levels of carbon dioxide. And three, a decrease in the blood pH. If any of these occur, the brain will then tell the muscles that control breathing to start breathing faster and deeper. 90% of the work of breathing is done by the diaphragm. That's the big muscle that goes right here. The rest, is done by the accessory muscles of breathing, such as intercostal muscles, which are the muscles that are in between your ribs. The diaphragm's job becomes harder when someone has a big belly, such as with pregnancy or morbid obesity, or when someone puts weight on your back if you're in the prone position. When this happens, there's decreased chest wall compliance, and if it's severe enough, it falls under the category of restrictive lung disease. For example, when someone is morbidly obese, they have restrictive lung disease. 
But let's say no one is sitting on your chest or your back and the diaphragm is able to contract without any issues. When that diaphragm contracts, it creates a negative pressure inside your chest, a vacuum effect. This causes air to flow from your mouth and your nose through your windpipe, meaning your trachea, and then into your lungs, and this process expands your lungs. If you zoom into the microscopic level of your lungs and take a look at the alveoli, that's where oxygen moves from the air into your bloodstream. To be more specific, that oxygen diffuses from the alveoli to the capillaries that surround your alveoli. Capillaries are the tiniest blood vessels in your body. The oxygen diffuses to the red blood cells and binds to something called hemoglobin. 99.9% .9 of the oxygen in your blood is bound to hemoglobin. The more hemoglobin you have, the more oxygen you have in your blood. This is known as blood oxygen content. But now we have to deliver that oxygen to different organs of the body, such as the brain. So how does it get there? The heart has to pump that newly oxygenated blood from the lungs and get it to the brain using certain arteries. The amount of oxygen the heart is able to pump to the body is known as oxygen delivery. There are four main arteries in the neck that deliver blood to the brain. You have two carotid arteries right here, and then you also have two vert vertebral arteries back here. They, they essentially go the same track as your spinal column. While all of this happens, carbon dioxide, which is a waste product of your body, needs to be removed from the body, which happens when you exhale. The blood that is delivered from the body and back to the lungs contains a lot of carbon dioxide, and that carbon dioxide then diffuses from the red blood cells to the alveoli, and then you exhale out that carbon dioxide. So in the alveoli, oxygen is going into the blood and carbon dioxide is leaving the blood. So now that we understand some basic human anatomy and physiology, let's turn to the medical term asphyxia. This is a Greek term that literally translates to stopping of the pulse. It's a generic term that refers to a condition in which there's inadequate delivery of oxygen to the body's tissues, often accompanied by a retention of carbon dioxide. There are hundreds of different reasons why this can happen. Usually when a medical examiner is using the word asphyxia, they're referring to airway compromise or compromise of blood flow to the brain, such as with mechanical asphyxia. But more on that in a little bit. So if someone were to die because of, let's say, a gunshot wound to the heart, technically it would fit that definition of asphyxia, but we would never say that said person died of asphyxia. We would say they died because of a gunshot wound that caused hemorrhagic and or cardiogenic shock leading to cardiopulmonary arrest. So when someone dies of asphyxia, as is the case of George Floyd, the determination of cause of death is dependent on information that's elicited based on the investigation. And this includes the deceased's personal medical history, the autopsy findings, the crime scene investigation, which of course includes video evidence. Mechanical asphyxia involves some physical force or physical abnormality that interferes with the uptake and or delivery of oxygen. In asphyxial deaths, the brain doesn't get enough oxygen, and when the pons and the medulla aren't getting enough oxygen, they can no longer function, which means they can no longer tell the diaphragm to contract, and the breathing then stops. While this happens, the heart is also not getting enough oxygen, and typically, when that happens, the heart pumps slower and slower until it stops. This process is accelerated if there's an underlying lung disease or underlying heart disease. Alternatively, instead of the heart slowing down before it completely stops, it can go into a fatal arrhythmia, such as ventricular fibrillation, and then completely stop. Now let's talk about some of the different types of mechanical asphyxia. There's choking, there's drowning, there's suffocation, meaning smothering, in which the nose and or the mouth are occluded. There's also compression asphyxia, which involves the presence of external force on the chest and or abdomen that prevents expansion of the chest as occurs when a car falls on top of a mechanic. Positional asphyxia is caused by the position of the body or part of the body leading to airway restriction, vascular compromise, or breathing fatigue. This can occur if someone is suspended upside down for a prolonged amount of time. When someone is handcuffed and in prone position and they have weight on their back, and if it's severe enough to the point where they can't breathe, this would be a combination of compression and positional asphyxia. Prolonged continuous application, typically minutes, of extreme pressure on the thorax, such as with the body weight of several officers, is capable of causing death. This is important because this contributed to the death of George Floyd. It wasn't just the knee to the neck. 
But now let's talk about asphyxia as it pertains to when there's pressure on the neck. The neck contains our airway. Right here is our trachea. And it also contains big blood vessels. As I mentioned, the carotid arteries right here, the vertebral arteries right here, but also the jugular veins, which go in parallel with the carotid arteries. The arteries here deliver oxygenated blood to the brain, while the jugular veins allow deoxygenated blood to flow from the brain down towards the heart. So what happens when pressure is placed on the neck? Well, it depends on a lot of different factors. Let's look at what happens with strangulation and hanging. Strangulation can be manual when hands or arms compress the neck, or it can be done with ligature, such as with a cord or a rope or a cloth, and that constricts the neck. Hanging is different from strangulation because the person's own body weight with a gravitational force is the source of the neck pressure. Contrary to popular belief, there doesn't have to be full suspension of the body for hanging to cause unconsciousness or death. In other words, the body can touch the floor and still cause death. And there's actually two types of hanging. There's judicial hanging, which is designed to fracture and dislocate the upper cervical spine. And then there's non-judicial hanging involving compression of the neck blood vessels with or without significant compression of the trachea. Restriction of blood flow to and from the brain is typically the major feature in non-judicial hanging or strangulation. In adults, there is a significant difference in the amount of force required to occlude the blood vessels in the neck and the trachea. Compression of the neck blood vessels without compressing the trachea can cause unconsciousness and death. In an adult, the amount of pressure necessary to occlude structures in the neck to the point of causing unconsciousness and death is estimated to be four to five pounds for the jugular veins and anywhere from five and a half to 22 pounds for the carotid arteries, anywhere from 18 to 66 pounds for vertebral arteries, and to compress the trachea, it's about 33 pounds. So these are estimates, and in reality, it depends on the body habitus. Does a person have a skinny little neck or a thick muscular neck? It also depends on the exact location of pressure. Is the pressure on part of the neck or all of the neck? If it's only part of the neck, what part of the neck is it on? How long is the pressure applied for? Do they have underlying carotid artery disease, meaning do they have underlying blockages in the carotid arteries from atherosclerosis? And still, there are other more indirect factors as well, such as underlying heart disease, lung disease, and drug use. Another important question is, what are the autopsy findings in someone who dies of asphyxia? Well, I'll start out by saying there are no pathognomonic findings for asphyxia. By that, I mean there aren't specific findings that only occur with asphyxia. And sometimes there are no findings at all with asphyxia. However, there are findings that are characteristic of different forms of asphyxia. The nature and extent of these findings depend on the kind of asphyxia. For example, in hanging and strangulation cases, there can be facial swelling, petechial hemorrhages in the face, eyes, and gums, which usually happens when arterial blood flow in the carotid arteries persists after jugular venous flow has stopped. Sometimes there can be skin markings such as scratches from nails, or ligature marks. You can also have internal neck structure damage like hyoid bone and laryngeal fractures. And looking at what happened to George Floyd, it wasn't a hanging or a strangulation, so finding facial swelling or petechial hemorrhage would be less likely. Thankfully, there was a video in this case because had there not been, there would be no chance of these officers getting prison time. A big question that comes up is the timing of how long it takes for asphyxia to cause loss of consciousness and how long does it take for the heart to stop after they lose consciousness? Well, that depends. There are a lot of variables, like what I mentioned earlier in this video. There have been experimental studies and videotaped events of hanging and strangulation that show rapid loss of consciousness after compression of the neck, typically within 20 seconds. In these instances, the last breath occurs no later than two minutes. But this is for hanging cases, which is not what happened to George Floyd. Unlike a hanging, where lack of circulation to the brain is the primary cause of death, when someone dies of asphyxia primarily because they can't breathe, meaning respiratory rest, they typically lose a pulse around the same time of when they stop breathing. And looking at the George Floyd video, he was unconscious for more than two minutes with the knee still on his neck. There's no doubt that during this time, he took his last breath right around the same time that he lost his pulse. By the time the EMS guy checks his pulse, I highly doubt he actually felt a pulse. 
because it was more than two minutes after George lost consciousness. It was obvious that when they moved George onto the stretcher, he was completely limp because he was dead. And it wasn't until much later did they start CPR in the ambulance. Now let's get to what the medical examiners had to say about this case. There was the Hennepin County Medical Examiner, and then there was the independent medical examiner, Dr. Michael Baden. The independent autopsy says, Floyd died of, quote, asphyxiation from sustained pressure when his back and neck were compressed, with the neck pressure cutting off blood flow to his brain. I agree with that assessment. That's what happened. I would also add that partial compression of the trachea causing airway compromise was also possible, but there's no way to prove or disprove that because you don't know how much pressure was being applied to that trachea. We know that because George was talking at least some of the time, you can conclude that he did not have total tracheal occlusion for the entire duration of the knee being on the neck. But the weight on his back made the work of breathing much harder for his diaphragm to contract, and the neck pressure at the very least meant less oxygen was being delivered to his brain and less carbon dioxide could be removed from his brain. After a while, the diaphragm becomes fatigued and no longer has the strength to contract, which means the lungs can't get oxygen into the blood and can't get carbon dioxide out of the blood. And whatever oxygen was in his blood, well, less of it was being delivered to his brain because of that pressure on the neck. And all of this caused him to lose consciousness. And probably within seconds, he lost a pulse. And despite losing consciousness, and despite losing a pulse, they continued to apply pressure on the neck and their weight on his back as well. The Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office said that the cause of death is, quote, cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement subdual, restraint, and neck compression, end quote. This statement doesn't really make sense to me. It seems like it's trying to say that police restraint and neck compression caused cardiac arrest, which is like what we talked about, asphyxia, although they didn't use the word asphyxia and it did not mention the weight that was being put on his back. But the Hennepin County release also says heart disease was an issue. The independent examiner didn't find that. The county said that fentanyl and methamphetamine were among significant conditions, but its report didn't say how much of either drug was in his system or how that may have contributed. So here's the thing. Let's say for a second, at least hypothetically speaking, he had underlying heart disease and he had fentanyl and methamphetamine in his system. So what? Could those have indirectly contributed to his death? Sure, but that's not the direct cause of his death. A better way to describe it would be to say they might have hastened his death had he not had heart disease or those drugs in his system. But either way, that's not what killed him. The officers had their weight on his back and pressure on his neck for a total of 8 minutes, 46 seconds. And for 2 minutes and 53 seconds after he lost consciousness. So Dr. Michael Baden got it right. But when he said, quote, police have this false impression that if you can talk, you can breathe, that's not true, end quote. Well, technically, if you're talking, you are breathing because in order to talk, you need to exhale. The airflow going out through your vocal cords is what allows you to make the noise through your voice box. That's what the vocal cords are. The process of exhaling is part of breathing. So technically, what he said isn't true, but I get what he was trying to say. I agree with the point that he was trying to make, which is this. Just because someone can talk doesn't mean they're not on the brink of complete cessation of breathing. George was pleading to breathe. He was pleading for his life, and it was taken from him. They didn't even bother to save his life when they knew he was dead. There were bystanders there yelling at them to check for a pulse, check for a pulse. They didn't even check for a pulse. They didn't even bother to start CPR. There needs to be justice for George.